bien, buenas tardes. Eh, bienvenidos a esta lectura eh, inaugural eh, del de, de simposio organizado por los profesores Roberto Posada, la profesora María Cristina Torrado, con la colaboración del profesor Jaime Yáñez y su respectivo grupo de trabajo. A nombre del Departamento de Psicología de la Universidad Nacional, pues le damos la. Bienvenida a ustedes, le damos la bienvenida al profesor Turiel, al profesor Nucci, y muchas gracias por su asistencia a esta convocatoria. Durante los siguientes dos días, eh, en el simposio sobre desarrollo psicológico y cognición social, un grupo de investigadores del país, de personas que trabajan en, en esa área general, convocada va a, a reunirse en el de simposio tratando de encontrar eh, temas, puntos de encuentro también entre los investigadores en el eh, país que conduzcan a desarrollos tradicionales eh, de una psicología en Colombia que ha visto un desarrollo tremendo en los últimos, eh, en los últimos años. Ese desarrollo no es casual, obedece al trabajo mancomunado de una serie de personas y de instituciones. En principio, lo que por mucho tiempo parecía un trabajo más individual, en el cual eh, creo que algunas personas, o espero que algunas personas eh, que están acá, que tienen más años en la psicología en el país, coincidan conmigo en esta apreciación que eh, encontrábamos a veces como difícil de establecer los contactos, la comunicación y la sinergia apropiada para ese trabajo eh, conjuntos, poco a poco fue mostrando frutos de ese interés en ocasiones terco de algunas personas para construir eh, trabajo mancomunado. Yo creo que este es un reflejo de ello, no es el único evento que lo muestra, pero creo que en los siguientes días veremos eh, con claridad ese efecto en los eh, colegas y en el propio hecho de que dos personas tan eh, destacadas como los profesores que nos eh, acompañan hayan aceptado eh, participar en él y hayan venido con todo gusto a, a mostrarnos su trabajo y también a escuchar el trabajo de los eh, colegas. No tengo nada más que agregar, sino una vez más agradecer a ustedes y a los profesores por su asistencia y felicitar de nuevo a los profesores organizadores por el eh, esfuerzo en la organización, no solamente la jornada del día de hoy, sino especialmente la jornada que sigue en los siguientes días. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes para todos. Eh, bienvenidos eh, a este evento que con gran esfuerzo hemos logrado organizar esfuerzo en todos los sentidos, uh, eh, trayendo a dos eh, personajes internacionales muy importantes para la psicología y a varios personajes, en total 16 eh, nacionales, que están también trabajando arduamente para aportar al desarrollo de la disciplina en nuestro país. Quiero a continuación presentar al profesor Elio Turiel, um, eh, quien va a dar la primera eh, charla, presentación en este simposio, una presentación eh, general sobre un tema que le solicitamos y que está organizado de acuerdo a todo el curso del evento y donde también incluimos y logramos vincular con Germán a la participación del profesor Turiel en la cátedra Mercedes Rodríguez. Entonces, eh, logramos acomodar las tres charlas que va a dar el profesor, lo mismo que las charlas que va a dar el profesor Nucci, eh, de una manera que no fueran eh, completamente desconectadas ni completamente eh, repetitivas. Entonces, eh, Elio Turiel va a hablarnos hoy a nivel general de eh, diferentes aproximaciones teóricas al desarrollo social y, por supuesto, va a hacer un énfasis en moralidad que es su campo de experticia. 
Quiero simplemente, eh, de una manera muy resumida, por la gran trayectoria que tiene eh, Elliot, eh, comentarles un poco acerca de su, de quién es él, de su, de su historia académica. Elliot Turiel es doctor en psicología de la Universidad de Yale y es actualmente decano asociado de la Escuela de Postgrados en Educación en la Universidad de California en Berkeley. Es también profesor asociado al Departamento de Psicología en la misma universidad. Enseña clases de desarrollo humano y su relación con la educación. Su trabajo investigativo se ha enfocado en el desarrollo social y moral, con un énfasis en dominios, en los juicios, las relaciones de la moral y la cultura, y la oposición y resistencia a prácticas culturales percibidas como injustas. Elio Turiel estudia las formas en que niños, adolescentes y adultos intentan contrarrestar desigualdades tales como aquellas basadas en el género, con actividades abiertas y encubiertas dirigidas a cambiar y subvertir prácticas que favorecen a aquellos en posiciones de poder en las jerarquías sociales. O en la jerarquía social. Ha ganado varios premios de financiación de proyectos en prestigiosas agencias internacionales y su, y su lista de productos académicos es bastante larga. Solo quiero mencionar en tal lista tres libros que son, pues, sintetizan parte de su trabajo. Uno de ellos, The Culture of Morality, Social Development, Context and Conflict. Eh, otro libro, Social Development, Social Inequalities and Social Justice. Y un tercer libro que eh, fue el primero, el, el que primero conocimos de parte de él, que se llama The Development of Social Knowledge, Morality and Convention. Y la lista se alarga muchísimo más, se alarga completamente con las decenas de artículos publicados en las más prestigiosas revistas de psicología y en manuales eh, también de psicología de desarrollo a nivel mundial. Entonces quiero que le demos la bienvenida al profesor Elio Turiel. Culture and moral and social development. 
and I will talk about the work on culture uh, tomorrow. Too warm for a jacket. <laughs> um, and tonight I will uh, use the topic of morality as a way of comparing the different the theoretical approaches uh, to social development. Um, but I should tell you that I will spend, even tonight and especially tomorrow, uh, more time on the approach that I take, which is an approach shared by other speakers at this uh, symposium, including Larry uh, Nucci and Roberto uh, Posada. And as you probably know, the field of psychology debated for, has been debating for a long time about explanations of development and behavior that focus on biology or environment. And these arguments have, and debates have included several uh, familiar terms, such as nativism, versus socialization, innate versus learning, nature versus uh, nurture. And psychologists will often say, we, we all often say, that it's not one or the other, that both have to be taken uh, into account biology and environment. Uh, but usually people take both into account by pointing to a quantitative combination. It's a little of this and a little of that. Uh, and yet, the arguments always seem to continue about which is most important. We can't seem to get away from that in many quarters of psychology. And I think it's so today, and it has been for a long time. Uh, one approach that I think is really different, the third approach, comes from developmental theorists like Jean Piaget and Heinz Berger, and it is that that development is not due to biology or to environment. Um, they don't determine thought, emotions, and actions, but rather development involves new constructions uh, through children's experiences and interactions with the environment, uh, including uh, the social environment. And uh, that's the approach that's consistent with my approach. So as I said before, I'll be talking more about that. But first, I will briefly review uh, some of the environmental and nativistic approaches uh, as contrast with the developmental approach. Uh, and um, I'll go back a little bit in, in the history and then get to some of the uh, examples of current uh, manifestations of, uh, of these uh, different points of view. So as I said before, the debates over environment and, and biology have been occurring for a long time since early in the 20th century, when behaviorism was dominant in North American psychology. Oh, so, I, I, I didn't show you that slide, I simply listed the, the developmental approach. Um, but um, uh, the, the, these debates, as I say, have been going on for a long time, and behaviorism was dominant in um, uh, in, in uh, North American psychology, and B.S. Skinner was probably the most influential of the behaviorists, and behaviorists, of course, maintained that learning occurs through the formation of habits or behaviors uh, as a consequence of reinforcements, of punishments and rewards. And behaviorists at the time, especially Skinner, wanted to do away with most of the commonly used psychological concepts and terms. So they claim that terms like personality, thinking, motivation, autonomy, freedom, and choice had no place in psychology. All the terms that we all tend to use. Uh, and, they, uh, and that they should be replaced by the language of behaviors, which is not to be more like the language of physics or other sciences like that. In later years, some psychologists thought that these aspects of behaviorism, doing away with all that language, and, uh, were too extreme, too radical. And they attempted to broaden behavioristic conceptions to include processes like imitation, 
uh, parent-child rearing practices and the influences of that, and the ways parents provide guidance in shaping and controlling children's values and behaviors. Um, but and these, these, pro these approaches, generally labeled social learning or socialization approaches, still focus, and they're, and they're, and they're um, certainly uh, prominent in, in current times, these approaches still focus on the forces of the environment uh, as influencing children's social and moral development. And one of the uh, better known analyses of uh, socialization and parenting comes from Diana Bomeride, who identified three major ways parents discipline and attempt to control their children, which I've listed there, the authoritative, authoritarian, and per permissive um, styles of child rearing. And uh, Bomeride has argued that the authoritative um, style is the most effective in, change, in shaping children to be competent uh, academically, morally, and in other ways. Um, and I won't go into that now. However, I do want to mention that these social learning and socialization approaches have been very much a part of recent analyses of the development of morality. And in these approaches, the development of morality is explained as a process of incorporating or internalizing the standards of, and, and values of the societies that they live in. Uh, and, it, and, and so, so these uh, standards and values of the society are seen to be transmitted to children, mainly by their parents, but perhaps other adults, um, such as uh, teachers. Uh, I should mention uh, one other approach in doing a historical review here, which is a psychoanalytic approach. Psychoanalytic explanations are more involved in the social learning explanations because, because uh, psychoanalysts saw much conflict in how children acquire society standards. Children must develop what they refer to as probably now a superego or a conscience with much guilt experienced. Um, and that all happens in the process of uh, children coming to learn to control strong instinctual drives and needs. But both psychoanalytic and socialization approaches each take what I would refer as a relativistic position of morality. Because morality for them involves learning of the values of one's society, and those can differ from society to society. So I'll give you a couple of, a, a couple of examples of how this is the case. Um, one example comes from um, a, a definition from a socialization theorist named Kochanska. <coughs> She said, socialization is the gradual developmental shift from external to internal regulation that results in the child's ability to conform to societal standards of conduct and to restrain anti-social destructive impulses, even in the absence of surveillance. Uh, here is another one which I, I won't read, you can read for yourself, but it basically states the same thing. And in all these cases, morality is defined as the values that are held by a given society. And the relativism stems from the idea that values can vary from one society to another, and they can't be compared with each other. They're just different. And I'll say more about that. I mentioned this too because uh, it's, it's, it's um, more relevant, that is, I mentioned the uh, issue of relativism, this is more relevant for what I'm talking about uh, tomorrow, so I'll say more about this tomorrow. Um, now, uh, I also want to mention another approach, uh, which is taken by uh, <coughs> cultural psychologists. Um, and, um, uh, and cultural psychologists attempt to explain social and moral development through cultural participation. They propose the cultures are cohesive and integrated, and uh, two uh, and that includes some references to contemporary cultural psychologists. Um, and, they, uh, and two major types of cultural orienta orientations, uh, according to them, supposedly exist. And these are orientations to individualism and collectivism. 
individualistic cultures in accordance to the uh, person and to moral right, and collectivistic cultures in accordance to the group and to moral duties. Uh, this features lists uh, attributes um, that are um, supposed to be associated with each type of culture, usually divided by Western and non-Western cultures. But I'm, not, I'm just showing this to you. I'm not going to go into this now. I will talk about it more tomorrow. Um, but now let me turn to biological, I don't want that yet. Let me turn to biological or nativistic approaches. Uh, they too have a long history, but with the availability of new methods of studying the brain, such as uh, the use of MRI machines, more researchers recently uh, have uh, tried to explain morality as genetically determined, as innate. And the main idea in this approach uh, is that people do not make choices, nor do they make judgments that involve reasoning. Uh, since decisions are determined biologically, they are predetermined, and usually uh, are, are not rational, non-rational or irrational. And this is because moral decisions are primarily driven by emotions. And much of the research in, neuro, in this neuroscience perspective involves presenting people, usually adults, with uh, what are referred to as the trolley car stories. People are given these stories while in an F F MRI machine. Uh, so here is an example of one of these tro trolley car stories. And, uh, it says, a runaway tro trolley is about to run over and kill five people, but a bystander can throw a switch that will turn the trolley onto a side track where we'll kill only one person. And then they're asked, uh, is it uh, permissible to throw the switch? Is that clear? Um, so in this case, an individual can throw a switch and cause the death of one person, but save five others. In a second story, um, an individual can throw a switch, um, uh, rather, an individual can push somebody and in that way save five lives. So it reads as follows. A runaway trolley car is about to run over and kill five people, but a vice maker who's standing on a footbridge can shove a man in front of the train, saving five people, but killing the man. Is it, same question, is it permissible uh, to do so, to shove the man? And here's one other story I think is put it mildly interesting um, used in these kinds of studies. Five patients are dying from organ failure, but a doctor can save all five if she cuts up a six healthy man, removes his organs, and distributes them to other people, to, uh, to the other five, killing one but saving five. Is it permissible? Now, the findings are, from the use of these kinds of situations, that uh, most people say it is all right to throw the switch, as in the first one. And most say the opposite, that it's not all right to push the person, as in the uh, uh, second story, and certainly not uh, to cut out the healthy patient to uh, save five, five others. Okay, so you can see the different responses to, uh, to the different stories. Most people say yes to one, most people say no uh, to the other two. And this, according to some of the researchers who've done this work, presumably shows that moral choices are not uh, rational, but are emotional. Why is that? Because of all these inconsistencies that they display. Um, uh, and also because a certain uh, brain, uh, uh, part of the brain happens to line up with some of these, these stories. 
And so they give a bi uh, biological explanation, but one in which uh, decisions are uh, uh, seen as mainly emotionally based and non-rational and often inconsistent. Now, one feature in this interpretation is the situation, these different, three different situations um, are seen by the researchers to be the same. Sacrificing one life to save five. Uh, now, there are many problems in this type of research that I can't go into now. It will take a, a long time. But um, I do want to point out that these are especially difficult moral conflicts and that they are not very representative of the types of decisions that people usually make. And this is because the stories present situations in which a strongly held value, the value of life, must be violated in order to maintain the same value. Let, let me repeat that in uh, case it's made. The, the, the situ, the, these, these stories present situations in which a strongly valued value, value uh, which is the value of life, people hold that value uh, strongly, has to be violated. You have to kill, take the life of one person in order to maintain the value of life through saving lives. So to save lives, you have to take a life. And these are what philosophers call hard or extreme cases. And in part, they're extreme cases because they essentially ask people to act like executioners, which is a very difficult <coughs> thing to do. And that's why I say that these situations are not representative of the types of moral decisions that people normally usually uh, make. And I don't think that uh, this is the best way to study moral development or moral decisions. Um, and we need other methods. So uh, I've talked about two types of explanations. One emphasizing the environment the, uh, in, 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 and the acquisition of society's standards and values, um, and the other emphasizing uh, that uh, morality is determined by biology or genetics. As I said earlier, there's a third approach uh, pioneered by Jean Piaget, and here you have what uh, Professor Piaget looked like at different ages. Those are all pictures of Jean Piaget. And in, and in his approach, which um, I don't think exists in, uh, in the first two ages or stages, but in his approach, um, children at young ages start to construct ways of thinking through interactions with the world, which they try to understand. That is, they try to figure out and understand the, uh, the world starting um, at a very young age. And here's how Piaget puts some of this. Socialization in no way constitutes the result of a unidirectional cause, such as the pressure of the adult community upon the child, through such means as education in the family and subsequently in the school. Rather, it involves the intervention of a multiplicity of interactions of different types and sometimes with opposed effects. And I think what he was saying here is that interactions and experiences children have are of many kinds. It's not only the influences of adults that uh, shape development. It also involves many different types of interactions, including, in, uh, importantly, interactions with other children. Uh, adults do not determine how children will think. And he also said about in this quote, that society is not just one thing. You can't characterize society in one way. It includes um, many features, and some of which can be contradictory with each other and make for conflicts. Now, Piaget himself mostly studied non-moral uh, cognitive development. But early in his career, he did research on moral judgments. He published a book in 1932, a very well-known book called The Moral Judgment of the Child. That research was later extended by Lawrence Kohlberg, some references to his work. 
And both Piaget and Kohlberg were trying to show that moral development is not a matter of acquiring society's values and norms, not a matter of internalizing these external standards, and that they were trying to show that moral action is not a matter of conforming with society's standards. Morality for them went deeper than that, and it has to do with understandings of issues like welfare or harm, concerns for the well-being of others, fairness and justice, and the rights of individuals and groups. But both Piaget and Kohlberg, in their developmental theories, thought that young children don't really understand these moral ideas, that's of, of, of welfare, uh, fairness, and rights. And they proposed levels of, uh, or stages of development, that is Piaget and Kohlberg, proposed levels or stages of development in which children, they thought, confuse morality with simpler and more self-interested matters, like avoiding punishment, obeying people in authority, or following rules. Rules that children, young children think are, are, are fixed and sacred. And Piaget had two main levels of moral development. One, uh, which he labeled uh, uh, heteronomy and autonomy. And children to, uh, to about the ages of not eight or nine or ten years think about morality and what he referred to in a heteronomous way, meaning that they see rules as fixed or unchangeable and that people in positions of authority uh, must always be obeyed. So as an example, Piaget stated, from this it follows, for example, that if distributive justice is brought into conflict with authority, the, young, the youngest subjects will believe authority right and justice wrong. Because they give priority to authority or rules over justice which they do not yet clearly understand. And in Piaget's view, moral, the, 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 the moral development of younger children then changes uh, to uh, a next level of morality, which he labeled autonomous. And so uh, at, the, at the older ages and at the higher level, uh, children distinguish ideas about harm and justice, moral ideas, from uh, questions of avoiding punishment, following fixed rules, and obeying authority. In later work, Colbert modified PFJ's formulation and he formulated um, uh, a sequence of stages and then more stages and then six stages. And you may be familiar with uh, the Goldberg stages, which I will not describe here, except to point out that Goldberg's form in Goldberg's formulation, younger people and going into adolescence confuse morality with the rules, customs, and conventions of their group. And they also judge morality uh, to be what people in authority dictate. So he had a level that he labeled, uh, a developmental level, that he labeled conventional morality. Uh, now, these propositions that children confuse morality with authority and with the conventions of the society has been, I think, contradicted by a lot of research conducted over the past 20 years or so. And this is the uh, research uh, that has directly looked at whether or not young children do make these confusions. And it's research that has been labeled a, a social domain approach, uh, and that many of us have conducted in, uh, over the years, including some people here, and including uh, Romero, and, and, and including Larry Gucci. And the research shows that um, by four or five years of age, children make moral judgments that they do distinguish fairness and welfare from the conventions and customs of society. They don't base morality on punishment or on what authority said. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But before I do so, I think that I can convey some of this, including what we mean by social conventions with the help of the great American writer, Mark Twain, um, and his novels, The Adventures of, 
uh, I'm Sawyer, and I, I hope you, some of you have read this in the Spanish version. <laughs> yes. Is he, uh, hold on, come up here. Yeah. Good. 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 That makes my task easier. Yeah. And um, perhaps you're familiar with his other important book, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Now, in The Adventures, the Adventures of Tom Sawyer, the first book that came first, and was written first, and uh, Huck Finn later, um, that book, the first book, is mainly about Tom's adventures and those of his friends, one of his friends being Huckleberry Finn. And they often run off at night to explore the world. Uh, they avoid school, and they act up in religious school. And Tom and his friends, it's one of the games that they play, are about 13 or 14 years old. And these children, in, in Mark Twain's telling, manage to get into a lot of conflict with adults. Conflicts which are usually over the children's desires to have fun and pursue the pleasures of life. And uh, they seem to reject many of society's customs and rules. And we can, we can see this in the way uh, Huck Finn was described in the first book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Huck had very little super, parental supervision, uh, and that's because he was described as the son of, and this is a term that was, I think, common at the, at the time, at least in the United in the West United States. He was described as the son of the town drunkard. Uh, that means translation. Town drunkard? Say that louder. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so because of all this, and because he lived in a free way, uh, Huck Finn was cordially hated and dreaded by all the mothers of the town because he was idle and lawless and vulgar and bad, and because all their children admired him so and delighted in his forbidden company. And Tom Sawyer was under very strict orders not to play with Huck. So he played with it every time he had a chance. <laughs> for me, for the book. What I want to illustrate through this mainly is how Mark Twain portrays children's attitudes toward many of the rules and conventions of the society that adults try to impose upon them. And I'll give you an example through one part of the story um, uh, in the book. There's one part of the book and a short story within it. And as that story goes, one time, Huck took great risks to save a woman named the Widow Douglas, um, who was a, a very upstanding woman in the community. He took great risks to save her from someone who was out to kill her. And so, as a consequence, he became a hero, Huck Finn did, in the town. And another part of this is related uh, to a time that Huck and and Tom found a hidden treasure in one of their adventures, so they became rich. Uh, so after Huck saved the, the widow's life, the widow insisted on taking him into her home and teaching him the ways of society, to become civilized, to become socialized. As I think you can see from this passage, Huck fits well with the fact that he was now under the widow Douglas' protection introduced him to society, and his sufferings were almost more than he could bear. The widow's servants kept him clean and neat, combed, combed and brushed. He had to eat with knife and fork, he had to use napkin, cup, and plate. He had to learn his book. He bravely bore his miseries for three weeks, and then one day turned up missing. So after he went missing, the adults, particularly the women, was trying to civilize him, were very worried they were, and, and, and concerned that something had happened to him and looked everywhere for him in town and couldn't find him. But Tom Sawyer knew exactly where to find him. And so he went, he went to Huck and tried to persuade him to go back to this uh, way of life. And here is how Huck responded 
Now this has a lot of slang, which uh, I can't repeat, but I think you can get, uh, I can't say properly, but I think you can get the idea. This is, this is how to been talking, and what he says to Tom, he wants him to go back. And he says, don't talk about it, Tom. I tried it, and it don't work. The widow's good to me and friendly, but I can't stand them ways. She makes me get up just at the same time every morning. She makes me wash and comb, comb me off with thunder. I got to wear them plain, plain clothes that just smothers me. Um, I got to go to church and sweat and sweat. I hate them ordinary for servants. I got to wear shoes all Sunday. The widow eats my bell. She goes to bed by a bell. She gets up by a bell. Everything's awful regular, but her body can't stand it. So, uh, Mark Twain, through this, was trying to convey the idea that adults often, often try to train children to accept many of society's conventions. Conventions having to do with ways of dressing, table manners, neatness, and other such regularities, like living by the bed. But, I think this is important, Mark Twain also portrayed children with a good moral sense. The children do not harm people. They tend to be fair to others. They feel sympathy for others. They are concerned with uh, harm and unfairness. And uh, they're sensitive to people's suffering. Um, and he goes into that much more in um, The Adventures of uh, Huckleberry Finn, which is about uh, equality and slavery. It's a story about uh, how been helping a runaway slave. This was the time, this was a, the time of slavery in the United States um, uh, to uh, go to another state where, where you could be free. Um, so that second novel is much more concerned with more moral issues. But the reason uh, that um, I've gone into some detail about these works of fiction, and they are fiction, I don't need to be I don't need to talk about this as research findings. It's fiction, but the reason I've gone into it in a little detail is that I think Mark Twain's um, characterization of uh, children is very insightful. I think it provides a very insightful picture of childhood and adolescence, and I think it helps us frame what we know from research on children's moral and social judgments, that is, the different domains of judgment. And one feature of the portrayal uh, that comes from uh, Mark Twain that I want to emphasize is that young children uh, do have a moral perspective on the world. They, they have emotions like sympathy and empathy, and they make moral judgments about harm and fairness, and they do try to help others. And he was trying to portray that as well. And, but he also conveyed how children are often in conflict with the expectations of adults. They don't, and they don't simply go along with a lot of what they are told. They can be critical. And uh, Mark Twain conveyed that much of the way in which children are, are dis disobedient has to do with what I'm referring uh, to as customs and conventions. Conventions having to do with as I said before, ways of dressing, neatness, table manners, and those kinds of rules. The research shows that by a fairly young age, children's moral judgments are different from their judgments about society's conventions. <coughs> uh, that is, children form, form different ways of thinking in what we refer to as domains. The These types of thinking and the distinctions among them are well documented by many studies. Um, and the general idea is that morality is not defined by people's personal desires and cho or choices, and it's not defined in the, in the way they think by the values of the group or the culture. Uh, these, the moral domain is based on understandings and feelings about welfare of harm, justice, and rights. And we refer to these as domains because at early ages, children's thinking about moral issues differs from uh, thinking about social conventions in systematic ways. 
And by the way, by moral issues, I mean acts like, uh, which are listed here, acts like hitting, taking things that uh, belong to others, causing emotional harm, and acting unfairly. By conventional issues, I'm referring to regularities of dress, forms of address, uh, greetings, and many of those types of rules uh, that children confront in their homes and in their schools. And the research has shown that children see customs and conventions as different from one setting to another, such as the home and the school. Uh, and another type of judgment children develop is about freedoms or personal choice. Uh, and these are aspects of life that are judged to be up to the individuals to decide, having to do with independence and autonomy. And I know that Larry Nucci will have much more to say about uh, work in the personal domain and define it more extensively than I have, I think, tomorrow. Um, but let me say a little more about the moral and conventional domains and their differences. Uh, but before I do that, I'll drink a little water. And I'll, I'll do that by referring to a study that was done many years ago having to do with the ways children distinguish between those two domains, morality and convention. And, and I do want to point out that um, many studies have been conducted since these, that early study on a variety of issues that have expanded our understandings of social development and social uh, decisions that people have um, uh, study uh, how morality and convention relates to understandings of social inclusion and exclusion, uh, to uh, authority, uh, to, to aggression and violence, uh, to rights. Uh, I won't go into any of those. The study I want to tell you about, which is an old, uh, older one, examined how children think about rules in the two domains. And in that study, children from six to 16 years of age were asked to talk about rules that they had at their home or at their schools. So they generated the rules. And then they were posed with questions as to whether the rules could be changed. Uh, as well as questions about whether the rules could be different in a different country. So this has to do with the changeability of rules and uh, the general, whether the rules, rules generalize to other contexts, other societies, other cultures. And here's what we found. First, for whether moral and conventional rules can be changed. Now, as you can see in that table, most said that, um, the, moral, that the moral rules should not be changed, but that the conventional rules can be changed. A very clear contrast. And I think it's helpful to give some light to the numbers with what children actually say. So I'm going to read an excerpt, excerpt from an interview with a six-year-old boy who participated in this study. Uh, so he was asked about some rules in the school. And he says, well, there's a rule about no running because you can slip, no hitting with balls, no scaring people, got to raise your hand. Now, I think you can guess which we would consider moral and which we would consider conversion conventional, like raising your hand versus no hitting the ball. Um, so he was asked, how are these rules made? And he says, the office people, meaning uh, <laughs> you know, the principal of the school, people like that. Uh, then we asked, can the rules be changed? And he said, yeah, they want to. But then we got more. We got more specific to see its evaluation of possible. The, there is evaluations of possible such changes. So how about the one had to do with throwing balls at people? Could that be changed? And he said, if it was, I wouldn't like it. Why? I don't want to get hurt. So notice the focus on harm, on hurt. And we have lots of we, we have lots of other evidence that it's not just about children thinking that they'll get hurt, but not wanting other children to be hurt. 
either. So we have uh, questions like this about not hitting, uh, hitting other people where children say, no, you don't want to hurt somebody, essentially. Okay. So um, then we ask, how about raising your hand? Could that be changed? It should, because the teacher's name is the same thing. So it doesn't matter. It could be one rule or the other. And that's part of what defines it as conventional for us and is consistent with the way a six-year-old sees it. So what's the big deal? We just came up with something that six-year-olds know. Um, so, and, and then remember that we asked about whether rules could be different in another country. And um, the results were basically the same for judgments about whether it would be all right if there were no rules uh, about the acts in another country. So the way we posed the question was, as you can see here, suppose in another country there's no rule about it. Would that be all right? Suppose that as a, in another country, there's no in a school, there's no rule about raising your hand. Would that be all right? And oh, as you can see, most said that it would not be all right for another country to have no rules about the moral acts. And just the, the reverse, uh, most said that it was all, would be all right with regard to the conventional acts, not to have a rule in another country. So. Uh, as I've been indicating, this study is only one example of many studies that, that have been done in several countries demonstrating how children's moral judgments differ in, I would say, in systematic ways from judgments in the other domains. Uh, and there's some unique features of judgments in each domain. And here is a summary of those features in this next slide. Moral reasoning, which, as I said, is about welfare, justice, and rights, has the following features in the way children and adolescents and even adults think about them. Um, and, uh, and, and, and morality is not dependent on rules, not dependent on what authorities say, uh, or existing practices, cultural or otherwise. It, it is seen as universally applicable. Reasoning about social conventions is based on the ways that they are given in the social system. They are dependent they are on rules and authority and existing practices in particular cultures. Uh, so uh, something that is judged to be a convention uh, is legitimately seen by children as, as, as uh, variable from one sense to another. Uh, and, 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 and uh, let me mention that many of the studies on these features of thinking in the domains involve presenting children with hypothetical situations. Much of the um, research is done that way, but uh, not all of it. So you shouldn't think that it's only how uh, uh, people think about hypothetical situations. Um, it's also how they think about uh, situations that Experience. We have also done studies that have included observations of social interactions in schools, in, in, in homes, in playgrounds, and have measured judgments about events that uh, children and adolescents have actually experienced, obtaining similar results. So in one study, um, just to give you an example, and here's a reference to it, we made extensive observations of children's activities in elementary and middle schools, that is, um, ages of about 7 to 12 years, and primary schools. Here in Colombia, is that right? In middle school, you refer to as. So, well, we, well, middle, middle school, school or secondary school? Second. So, starting with uh, maybe uh, uh, 11 years ago. And we interviewed children, so, so, um, so we did extensive observations of their activities, which we recorded. And, and then we interviewed children, and we did analyses of their social interactions. Um, but what I want to get to is that we interviewed children about moral and conventional events that they had experienced. And the interviews were conducted immediately, very, very soon after the events had occurred. And we found that when making judgments, about events that they had actually experienced, children made the same distinctions 
between morality and convention that we saw in studies with hypothetical situations. So these hypothetical situations do apply to real, actual events as well. In that same study, by the way, we interviewed uh, the children about hypothetical situations uh, maybe a month later, and uh, their judgments about the hypothetical situations a month later were very similar to the judgments uh, about the events that they made about the events that they had experienced. Uh, and as I said, we've done a number of observational studies, and the different observational studies have shown that children communicate with each other and with adults in different ways around events in the different domains. So the way they communicate with each other about moral issues is different uh, from the way they communicate with each other about conventional issues and about violations or tra transgressions in each domain. And part of all this, as related to children's development, is that it is important to recognize that children have many different types of social experiences. What Piaget was stressing, as I quoted him earlier, it's not only teaching from adults. Uh, the world out there is quite varied for children, and the events in their life, for young lives, are part of the experiences contributing to their development. They participate in many events, such as people harming or helping each other, sharing or failing to share, they get involved in arguments and conflicts. And these involve social experiences that influence their moral perspectives and moral development. So this, again, this means that children do not simply uh, accommodate to or conform with uh, social norms or social standards out in the world there. And very importantly, they, they reflect upon their experiences, starting at a pretty young age. They think about what is occurring, about their own reactions, about the reactions of others, and they try to make sense of what they experience. And just as an aside, I want to stress how that perspective, making sense of their experiences, and making sense of many experiences is something that contributes to development, is a very different from the socialization or social learning or psychoanalytic approaches that I mentioned earlier and certainly different from uh, uh, the nativistic approaches that we see currently in neuroscience. And I want to, I think I have a few minutes, um, I want to illustrate what I mean by some of this again through examples of what children have to say. And these examples come from a study that was done by Cecilia Weinrich uh, from the University of Utah and her colleagues, and that's a reference to it. And in that study, children were asked to provide narrative accounts of times that they felt hurt by the acts of another person and times in which they had hurt someone. So two kinds, they were asked to um, relate events they had experienced in which they felt that they were hurt by somebody else, and in which they uh, think they hurt someone, somebody else, both types. And this monograph has many examples of children from four or five, five years of age to 16 years of age, who show that they are aware of their own and other ch children's reactions and social interactions, and the emotions, some of the emotions that are the youngest children uh, in the study were about four years old, uh, preschool children, were, were pretty brief in uh, their narratives. Uh, but they were aware of children's reactions. And here are, uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, first, a um, young girl who said, my friend Sydney, when I came inside her house, she, so she, she's uh, relating an example, so, uh, an event in there. My friend said to me, when I came inside her house, she said she really didn't want to play with me, and she hit me, and I felt bad, and so I asked her mom if I could go home, and she said yes. Um, and um, here is what a four-year-old um, <coughs> boy related. I was playing with my friend Adam, and I said something that really hurt him, and he said, I don't like that. 
and I stopped. I also pushed him. And I said, I'm sorry, because he told me he didn't like it. And somewhat, so uh, I think you can see in these brief statements uh, that, that there's some awareness there of what's going on in these social direct interactions, including some of the emotions involved. But by five, by uh, six or seven years of age, uh, children are more reflective about feelings and mutual expectations. And here is what a girl said, and this was about a time she felt ignored by a girl she thought was her best friend, but that other girl had referred to still another person as her best friend. So this girl said, and I kind of thought to myself, that was kind of making me feel bad. So I wonder if I can go over there tell her that that kind of hurt my feelings. Now, she's not saying, I'm going to tell my, my, my mother about this. She's going to go and talk to the other child about it. Um, she's the best friend of mine, and I just can't get it out of my mind because whenever I walk home from, and, and no, I can't get it out of my mind, because whenever I walk home from her house, at night time, she would always give me a hug, and I would always do that, and I never want to leave her house. Then at the birthday, I'm wondering if he's really her best friend, this other person that uh, she had referred to as her best friend. So I think you can see that this young, very young person is aware of emotions, conflicts, and can be somewhat reflective. Uh, now let me jump to adolescence with an example of a girl in high school um, talking about a time that she, I think she was 15 years old, let's see in a second, talking about a time she tried to get out of spending an evening with one of her best friends, a 15-year-old girl. And she said, and I remember I kind of lied to her, but I mostly like avoided her one night. And then she figured it out and found out that she felt really bad and was hurt. And so it wasn't good, because I bet she felt betrayed. Maybe she even thought, I don't care about her. But I didn't want to hurt her feelings, because she's one of my best friends. But it's hard. Here she's saying, life is hard. <laughs> but it was hard just because I felt so pressured. Like, it happens a lot, I know. It happens to a lot of people my age. Especially that you feel so pressured that you want to do something with one person, but then you promise to another person, and you want to be everyone's friend, and you don't want to hurt anybody, but you also really just want to do what feels good, and that definitely was a part of the situation. But I mean, she got over it, we're friends and everything. So, I mean, that strikes me as a very complicated set of uh, reflections on relationships and emotions. And I don't think her parents or her teachers gave her this. So, and I think you can see that in adolescence, but in younger children as, as well, uh, there is reflection on what has been done to them and what they do to others. They're aware, aware of conflicts and social struggles. And I think you can see that there are also age differences in these responses. Uh, this 15-year-old, uh, does understand things uh, somewhat differently from the six-year-olds and the four-year-olds. Um, and although children distinguish the domains at young ages, and although the domains involve different types of thinking across ages, um, there are developmental changes, and developmental changes occur within the domains, not between them. So there are, there, there are, we have identified, for example, levels of development for thinking about conventions. Uh, we, it's not, it's not we, it's Larry Ucci, has identified levels of thinking about um, issues in the personal domain. So two different strands of development. It's more difficult to study development in the moral domain um, for various reasons I can't go into now. Uh, but Larry and I are currently analyzing data from a study on the development of moral judgments that is trying to ascertain um, the developmental pathway within the moral domain 
and how it's different from the other two domains. And I, I really, as I said, can't uh, go into this. Uh, it takes much too long. Except that I want to say that with age, adolescents are better able to take into account different and competing aspects of social situation and context uh, and, and try to coordinate those, and try to uh, weigh one against the, the other. Um, maybe tomorrow I'll say more about that. But I should conclude. And um, to conclude, I want to return uh, to the issue of reflection in uh, that, that children and adolescents and adults engage in with regard to social experiences, what we saw in the responses of the children and adolescents in the study by uh, Weinrich, Weinrich and her uh, colleagues. This kind of reflect reflection also occurs in evaluations of the fairness of systems of social organization, cultural practices, and social inequalities. And I'm now really introducing a whole other topic, but related. Uh, and these are reflections that can produce social, what I refer to as social opposition and moral resistance. And those are the topics of my talk tomorrow. That's, uh, that's the, the, the title is Moral and Social Reasoning, the Role of Inequalities and Justices and Social Opposition. Um, and whether people engage in opposition and resistance, and I'll say more about what I mean by that tomorrow, is approached in different ways in the different theoretical approaches I outlined uh, earlier. It's especially approached differently from a developmental perspective and the, the kind of research that I've done on these topics, and that of the cultural psychologist I mentioned earlier who made that dichotomy between individualism and collectivism. And so tomorrow I'll consider some of these differences in, the, in, the, in approaches and talk about some research that looked at, looked at opposition uh, and resistance. <laughs> so we continue. Yes? 
so the second part of the question is what about sociopathology and morality? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean, uh, whoever asked the question, by sociobiology, because you know, there, there's a technical use of that term uh, that was introduced mainly by E.O. Wilson in his book, Sociobiology. And that has a particular point of view. Uh, and if you mean by that point of view, if you, if you mean by the term, uh, that point of view, uh, I don't agree with it because um, of, it, of its emphasis on the evolutionary sources of morality in the ways that it, it, it actually built in moral reactions. So there has been a lot of research that presumably shows that altruism goes along with uh, William Theory because uh, I can't go all of this, but the uh, number, of, number of relatives that uh, are involved in altruistic acts. Uh, but the main point is that uh, I don't agree with the approach because of my emphasis, because I really believe uh, that children uh, come into the world with very general biological features that allow them to think about the world, but gradually as they're getting older, and they can think in new ways. These are not ways that are either handed out to them or there because of the way they were born. Um, if you mean by that, what about sociobiology and morality? That is, what about, what is the relationship between morality and biology? And how do we explain that? Yeah, there should be some relationship, but I think we have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> or how do we go about studying it intelligently? And one reason is because we really have to understand first uh, all the complexities of human thinking, of human reasoning, of human feeling. Uh, and I think it's very complex, and all the ways in which it gets constructed. Uh, before we can even start to think about how we might relate them uh, to biology. Uh, the first part of the question was, uh, we also was the studio of sociobiologists and biology. Uh, yeah. And that's, yeah, that's with relation to the trolley car study. study. Mm -hmm. I think you can see that I don't think much of that as a way to really study morality. Um, now, I'm working, now I'm working in a program which tries to teach abilities that has to do with emotional intelligence. That teach abilities. Abilities? Abilities? That has to do with emotional intelligence. How to nurture empathy in children. Uh, 12 years old, do you know? Do you know any researcher? expert on that field of educating empathy? Um, do I know anybody in that field? Uh, Larry? <laughs> I have to rely on my friend and colleague, Larry Lucci, who knows much more about moral education than, than I do. And uh, both knows much, uh, has much better ways of thinking about it than those of literature much more than I do, and I think you can probably answer the question uh, about what research exists. The, other, the one thing I would say about it is that uh, I'm not convinced that we should be trying to teach empathy itself. Mm -hmm. Teaching empathy is a good thing, but it has to be connected, in my view, with it, its relationships to moral judgments. Uh, and, and, and a process of educating for both and how the two go together. And I do think that there are people who will just focus on empathy and think that's enough. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> In this case, you 
say it more than universal. How would you differentiate one from another? I don't know how to differentiate them. Uh, I, I, I don't think I can remember them right now. I've read philosophers making some interesting distinctions from a philosophical point of view between ethics and morality. I think both terms, I mean, the term morality, when it's being studied in, in people, children, adults, uh, is sufficient. I, I, I don't know that there's a useful distinction to be made as a psychologist uh, between the two. And I think that moral philosophers, especially in contemporary times, primarily concentrate on moral philosophy. I uh, may be wrong about that, but I think they haven't uh, concerned themselves that much about uh, ethics versus morality. Okay, and the last question is, is there any moment in development where morality consolidates? Or is there a consolidation moment for morality? A consolidation? Yeah. <laughs> um, what, I'm not sure what is meant by consolidation. Uh, I mean, I think that there's a, yeah, like a final point. Uh, like a final point. I see. Okay, then point. Uh, well, we we don't we're, we're trying to study that, uh, that research that I mentioned at the very end that I'm doing with Larry Nucci. Uh, but I think that I don't I don't view it quite that way. I, what we're finding is that for many situations, our, our uh, seven, eight-year-olds make judgments that are very much like our oldest subjects who are 16 or 17 years old. No differences. But then we also have situations that uh, are much more complicated, that bring in more variables, bring in conflicts, bring in self-interest, the interests of other, other people. And, um, uh, and, and, and and many of these situations that we're, that we're presenting to, uh, to the children and asking them to make, to make judgments about have more components than some of the others. When this situation is simple and, and one component, should you help this person who needs help? Uh, is it right or wrong to hit this person because uh, you feel like hitting somebody, you're mad at them, uh, things of that sort? We don't get differences. It, 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 in understandings that it's wrong to do that between the younger and older children. When the situations get more complex and things have to be related to each other, then older uh, people are uh, better able to coordinate these different uh, contexts. And uh, uh, there are other aspects to, the, to a very complicated developmental process. But I guess I don't want to see it as an end point of consolidation because even among adults, there's a lot of variability depending on what the situation involves. I mean, there's a lot of variability between a person's judgment in one context and another. There is one more. No, one more. How about the studies? The interview you introduce us to us in your presentation. Uh, so have all the studies being made in the USA, USA population? Have you considered doing them in other continents? Uh, we've done a number, number of studies in many other places. We, were, we started in the United States, uh, but we, the studies have been done both on the moral conventional distinction and other aspects, studies on life, studies on uh, democratic uh, thinking, uh, studies on exclusion and inclusion, um, many other topics. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about studies that uh, have to do with inequalities that were done in, um, in the Middle East, in Japan, in India, in Benin, and of all places in Colombia. Um, so this is to say that uh, our research, and, and I think some of it is being done right now. Uh, our studies, although the initial studies were done in the United States, now studies have been done all over the world. I, I think I just need some clarification on short ideas on, on your 
definition of um, morality, morality the, the way. You mentioned that it does not depend on morality, it does not depend on social practices. So first thing I'd like to know what do you mean with social practice and why morality does not depend on it. Well, what I meant by that, and that may be, uh, I can easily say this if you see anybody else on this next one. I'll use this one. Uh, what I meant is that people, now I'll talk about social and cultural practices tomorrow that involve inequalities and ones in which there are moral components. But what I meant is that if people's thinking, something is not judged to be moral simply because it's a practice in a place. Okay. So you do it this way. In, uh, we do it uh, a certain way in California. Uh, and people in, uh, in Arizona do it a different way in other states. Um, you know, or obviously a better example would be it's done one way in the US, it's done another way in India. Okay? From a cultural psychology point of view, um, this is the theorists, the researchers, because it's done differently in different places, um, then it's, it can be moral here, and something just the opposite moral in the other place. But the, what, what I was talking about was that in all our studies, we find that children and older people don't say it's moral because it's done. And just like that six-year-old said, yeah, they can, the, the, the office people, you remember that example, the office people, can change the rule, but that's not okay just because they do it. That's what I meant. Fútbol exige una serie de reglas 
que todos deberían cumplir y es una manera de ser tratados igual si todos eh, se someten a las mismas reglas. Por último, hay criterios de universalidad que cambian de acuerdo al contexto de lo moral y que realmente muchas veces en las investigaciones psicológicas se quedan en, en experimentos o en dilemas tan obvios y tan elementales que tienen que ver con la relación con el otro que realmente en esos casos no había discusión, pero si tratamos de ver que lo que está planteando es si la universalización del pago de la vida, si la universalización del procedimiento o la idea de equidad, pues se empieza a ver uno que hay muchas versiones, muchas concepciones que realmente no quedan muy claras en la investigación psicológica. <risa> bastante sofisticado para comprender esta cuestión. How long, sorry? Paraphrase what the professor said. I think I understood the part about. I think I understood the part about um, putting parents uh, off to die at the age of. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, and, and I have a. a I have a lot of ideas about that, but well, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase it in okay. short words. Um, okay. what the professor just said that it's pretty common to reuse the dilemmas, the moral dilemmas, or, or examples to, to try to, you know, do some research on the moral um, field. But what is not usual is to ask questions or raise questions about morality and what's behind morality, the details of morality. So one thing he says is yes, morality, morality is, is universal, or the state of general state is, is universal. Yeah, morality, morality, morality is universal. Is universal. Uh, it's a it's a regular statement. It's acceptable normally to say that. But but it is not really what that's the statement. That's is what it says it's because you can say that you pretend that morality. Is universal, but you can also say that you you bring some examples in which it's not universal. An Eskimo example, in which it's acceptable for you know you kind of killing your, your dad because you don't want to uh, leave him you know grow or get old in a in a not very beautiful manner. Or he was using the example of Gandhi, in which Gandhi accepted that it was okay for. Um, uh, Stop the, the, the independence war between the from, from the British Empire and holding Kiel Nazis and, and that kind of stuff. So it was acceptable for Gandhi, um, for Gandhi to, to kill and so on. But what he's saying is that what is acceptable or what should be universal is not morality but the defense of dignity. The problem is content or the content of morality. Is, uh, is a problem that has not been approached in the proper manner from psychology. So when you start talking about the actual content of morality, what, are, what, are, what, what do you want to see when you say fairness? What's behind it? That's the real detail. The problem is not using different examples. It's going in deep into the, the content of morality. Uh, uh, from my point of view, uh, yes, we have time. <laughs> I see you looking at your watch. Uh, <laughs> I actually think, I, I, I will say only a little in answer to that question, much, much, much longer than the question was actually, uh, because I think it relates, uh, are you coming tomorrow? Because <laughs> yeah, I think, it, and maybe you can ask it again, because I think it relates to uh, the research I'll be talking about tomorrow. But let me say two things. One is that it is, I, I think you're raising issues of variability or differences in uh, moral decisions. So the example of putting uh, parents to, uh, to their death at a young age, presumably in practice in some cultures in the past, uh, is a useful one and um, it's been discussed by philosophers. It was discussed in a very interesting book by an anthropologist named Elvin Hatch called, uh, I think, uh, Culture and Morality. And it was discussed by Solomon Ash, who was a uh, psychologist, uh, early part, uh, mid middle part of the 20th century. And what they pointed out was that the, the differences between a culture that doesn't do it and a culture that does do it is, is not in their moral values, this is a term they use, 
Uh, because the moral values were the same, which was to be concerned with the welfare of their parents. But rather the difference was in the means to attain that welfare. And so in, in, in cultures where it's thought, where it's believed that we have done research on something we refer to as informational assumptions uh, that uh, pertains to this, but in cultures where it is believed that there's an afterlife, and that if uh, people do not reach the af afterlife in good health, uh, they will suffer in the afterlife. In those cultures, then to further the welfare of their parents, they engage in this act. That's their goal. That goal, or that moral value, they argue, and I would agree with this, is the same as the moral value in a culture where it is not believed that there's an afterlife or that uh, you will suffer uh, because of your state of health when you die. And then to further the welfare uh, of, of, of your parents, you don't do this. It doesn't even occur to you to do this. So that's one part of my answer. The other part of my answer is that I don't think we can look at variability by the decisions that people make, because many decisions involve conflicts between different moral goals. And so there could be a conflict between the moral goal of the welfare of somebody, even the value of life of a person, and an issue of honesty and trust, for example that we have studied and that philosophers have discussed about. So, uh, discussed. And so philosophers give um, the example, which some of you heard me talk about earlier today, uh, the example of, um, to, to, to argue from a particular point of view, they give the example of uh, someone who's standing on the street and, he's, and somebody else goes, uh, running by him, and he's clearly running away from somebody and is trying to get away, and he goes and hides. And then another person comes along who you know, you're standing on the street, is out to murder, to kill this person. And he asks you, where did he go? Well, what's the moral thing to do? What's the value there? There is the value of honesty that people hold, but there's also the value of saving a life that people hold, and that's a conflict. Now, in most cases, uh, philosophers would say, you, 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 you lie. And in, in research that we've done, not, a, not particularly on this example, but where there are conflicts between honesty and other moral values, uh, many, in many situations, many people say it's acceptable to lie. Not because they think lying is a good thing, but it's the lesser of two evils, so to speak. So that's a very partial answer to your question, but I think we'll get to these issues tomorrow. Okay, and the last question, Helen. Okay. <laughs> Professor Furiel, um, I know that you are connected to the field of education, and I'd like to ask you a very simple question. You said that children are able to make their own judgments, moral judgments, and their own reflections. Um, it seems that sometimes the education systems are, let's say, designed from the adult-centered point of view, and they are more interested in the teachings of conventions, sometimes ignoring those judgments and reflections children do. I'd like to know what's your perspective, or how should educational systems act towards this topic? You may guess. I'll rely on my friend Larry Nucci again, <laughs> since it's an educational question. And, 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 and I say that part in jest, but part seriously, because he's, he's, he's actually, I think, uh, both in, in research and in theorizing, trying to address this kind of, of issue. And uh, I think what he would say, and what I would say, is that uh, it's important for teachers to be clear um, there, there, there's nothing wrong, and it's often necessary uh, to impress upon students that the conventions are important to follow. Um, you know, I wouldn't say, like, uh, like you might gather from Tom Sawyer, that all of these conventions should be thrown out the window, right? But it is important that they be clear in communicating to children 
that, th that these are conventions and there are conventional reasons for following them and that they shouldn't be confused, that the teacher shouldn't confuse these with moral issues and they should try hard to make sure that the children don't confuse them with moral issues because the teacher is communicating in a certain way. Thank you very much, Harriet. Uh, Thank you very much. Muchas gracias a todos y todas por venir hoy. Para los que están inscritos para las siguientes sesiones del simposio, ya donde va a haber paneles de investigadores internacional y por colombianos nacionales. Eh, por favor, les recomendamos que lleguen eh, temprano, un poco antes de la hora de que está citado, para que puedan reclamar sus escarapelas y puedan entrar y acomodarse sin problema. Gracias y espero verlos mañana.